Hi everyone and welcome to Between the Lines, part of Fault Lines look at the cracks in America's criminal justice system. We're going to Chicago today to take another look at yet another problem that's taking place in the city. I'm happy to say we're joined by Ken Womble, a uh, criminal defense attorney based in Brooklyn and contributor to Fault Lines. He joins us via Skype. Ken, welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me, Lynn. Of course. So, um, it seems like we're talking about Chicago more and more lately. I gotta say, CPD uh, makes New York City's cops almost look European uh, by comparison. Um, lots of problems. We're gonna drill down today on something that I thought um, got a little bit overlooked in the news flow, and that might be because we're, we're lawyers and maybe we're a little bit more sensitive to this kind of thing. But I wanna talk about the, the case of Jordan Marsh. He was uh, a city attorney uh, who, uh, it turns out, uh, covered up evidence uh, in a police shooting case of, of one Darius Pinnock. Um, he resigned, I, I believe, last week. And uh, really, really interesting case. Can you walk us through what exactly Jordan and Marsh did before we dive deeper? Yes. Uh, so it, it was actually Jordan Marsh uh, was the city attorney on a case, like you said, of Darius Pinnock. Uh, there were two officers that were charged, uh, Raul Mosqueda and uh, Gildardo Sierra. Uh, those were the two officers that pulled over uh, Penex's vehicle, uh, which was a, a, a Oldsmobile Aurora the night of the incident. The issue in the trial itself was what the police officers actually heard over the radio transmission that night. Um, just a little bit of background on that, because this is something that not a lot of people really know about, but as a, as a criminal defense attorney, uh, it's incredibly important, but anytime a police officer is out on patrol, there's the constant communications coming in over their radio. That is recorded. Uh, I, I have had a trial where, where I had a client where I did a retrial. Uh, they did, uh, or that, that individual did, years in jail before the retrial, and the radio run proved his innocence and he was released. Uh, it's incredibly important information that exists in almost every single case, especially the ones involving the police. And uh, in, in this case, it's actually uh, central. So going back to uh, the Penick case and uh, Jordan Marsh's role, basically Judge, uh, judge Chang, uh, the federal judge who made this ruling, he not only found that Jordan Marsh was at fault for intentionally withholding evidence, uh, but he also found that Thomas Alman. Uh, his co-counsel, another city attorney, was also at fault, but more for negligence. And I want to start there because that's kind of where it begins. Uh, in a civil rights case, in a civil case, uh, the estate of Darius Penex sued the city and these two officers for wrongful death. Um, at, throughout the trial, there's a discovery process, as there is in, in any case, and the plaintiff's attorneys, Penex's attorneys, they filed discovery requests for any of the recordings, any of these radio runs that existed. Uh, Thomas Alman basically went into his already existing department file, shuffled through, looked around, didn't find what they were looking for, and basically said at that point, well, they, we just don't have them, they don't exist. That was the information that was relayed to the court and to Penex's attorneys, and the case proceeded. Basically, the, the issue here is whether or not these officers heard a radio transmission that said that the individual in the Oldsmobile is armed or whether or not they were involved in a shooting. It, it sounds like Jordan's colleague here is uh, a bad lawyer, but Jordan's conduct is, is, is something that, that's a little bit worse. It sounds like it's more like a criminal offense. Um, what's, what's next here in, in assessing uh, Jordan's behavior? Well, there's not really anything else to assess. It's, uh, Judge Chang made it abundantly clear in his ruling, meticulous ruling, where he laid out, uh, you know, with, with incredible clarity, the timeline of events that occurred in this case. And basically, uh, if you want to go to the Chicago Tribune, you can find uh, the judge's decision. And, you know, if you want to read through it, you're going to find out that there, there's a mixture here, and let's not forget, Jordan Marsh is not just some attorney. He was a senior corporation counsel in the city handling wrongful death with the wrongful death cases defense with the Chicago Police Department. He was way up there. And if you look through his conduct, it, it's clear that he was not only uh, a, a bad lawyer, but he was also incredibly dishonest because as it came to light, 
He told the judge at first that, and, and, and mind you, none of this would have come to light but for one of Jordan Marsh's selected witnesses slipping up during an off-the-record off conversation with counsel uh, and, and outing the fact that the recording for uh, Mosqueda and Sierra's actual zone, the one that they did here, did in fact exist and had existed this entire time. But we have uh, pretty clear evidence here of two city attorneys acting uh, very, very badly to the detriment of, uh, of uh, the investigation of the death into, uh, of, of Darius Pinnock's. Um, it sounds like there's something more problematic at, at play at, at, in this particular department rather than the malfeasance of just two individuals. Well, I think the funny thing here is that Rahm Emanuel seems to be running kind of the same defense that he tried to run for Officer Jason Van Dyke in the Lake Quan McDonald shooting. If you remember, uh, when that first really came about and came to light, Rahm Emanuel told everybody that Jason Van Dyke was just a bad apple and basically said he has full faith in the department. Fast forward to where we are, Jason Van Dyke, he's now been indicted, and uh, uh, McCarthy, the superintendent, well, ex-superintendent of Chicago Police, has been fired. Um, but, I, I mean, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Emmanuel about this particular in incident with Jordan Marsh in the law department, when he was questioned, should the, uh, should the feds, should the FBI uh, expand and include the law department in their investigation, uh, he basically said that as far as misconduct in the law department, quote, that's not possible when you're in front of a judge and getting a judge's ruling. I, I personally can't make any sense of that, and that's kind of... If you look at if you look at some of the some of the things that have been said in defense by Anita Alvarez, by Ron Emanuel, by Jordan Marsh, by the police unions, there is this there's this undercurrent of just gibberish. Whenever they're caught in these lies, uh, and not in these lies, but basically said, you know, here's misconduct. What do you have to say about this? The, the sentences that they put together to defend themselves and to defend and deflect uh, are, are just absolute nonsense. And that's exactly what Rahm Emanuel is doing here. He's gone with the bad apples, but he has full faith in the law department. And personally, I don't understand how he can because one of its top attorneys, now ex-attorneys, well, ex-law department attorney, the, the, the ethics committee and the disciplinary committee, I'm sure will look into this. But he committed a, 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 just an egregious act of misconduct and uh, and in essence cost the city 300 and I think in the ballpark of $300,000 in legal fees because of his misconduct. Will Jordan Marsh keep his law license? It's hard to imagine any scenario where he would at this point. Uh, uh, it's tough for me to say there's really not a whole lot of precedence for disciplinary committees uh, really removing law licenses in cases like this. Uh, there's really not a lot of uh, discipline that does occur out there there's more than sufficient evidence here that that is exactly what should occur. Um, do I think it will? I, I, I guess we just have to wait and see on that one. What about criminal charges? Um, I, I don't really think that there are necessarily available criminal charges here. Um, there is, the, per, the only thing that I can see is, is you know, I mean, basically what Jordan Mark did is he knew about the existence of a recording prior to the trial and then in the middle of the trial it came out not through his own actions but through just kind of the the eventual honesty of one of his chosen witnesses and by the way he chose a witness when he knew that if he had chosen the other witness from that same department that other witness would have would have had to have said that this recording does exist so his whole strategy was clearly to try to steer the trial around this, uh, what I would consider damning evidence, uh, against uh, against the city, and he just got caught with it. I think that uh, him being fired, uh, him losing his law license, uh, I think that's probably as far as it will go, because in, in, this might be part of why the public is having a, a tough time kind of you know, getting into this particular story, it has all the makings of the misconduct that we're hearing about uh, in, in so many other cases, and especially in Chicago. But at the end of the day, we're not talking about someone who spent time in jail. We are clearly talking about the loss of life. But 
this is a civil case. And when we're talking about money, I think that people, and I, I particularly, I rarely think of uh, the civil uh, part of the game, the, the civil part of this, really being involved in police misconduct. And I think that's what this case has shown us is that, you know, you've got people who are uh, beaten, killed, uh, and, and have every kind of misconduct uh, uh, done upon them. And then they are uh, spit out by the criminal justice system. And then when they go to the civil system to try to get justice and try to get redress, uh, they're meeting more of the same, which is government attorneys covering for the police. Mm. So this is someone who probably handled an awful lot of cases uh, for the city of Chicago. Does it make sense to go back and re-examine them? Yes. I mean, there absolutely is every reason. Uh, there's every reason to go back in and look at all the other cases. If this was a, a senior city attorney who was handling a high profile case with this, you have to assume that his supervisors were looking at what he was doing. Uh, this is a, a case where the city was on the hook for millions of dollars that they lost. And, and it looks like on the second trial, they very well might. There has to have been higher ups who were involved in this case and they were watching uh, an attorney hide evidence. They should have known that. So I think it, it's very easy for the city of Chicago. If the city of Chicago, the mayor's office, if they actually want to put their money where their mouth is and change the culture where the police are run amok and are basically having their, their water held for them by uh, the district attorney's office and now we're finding out the city attorneys, uh, the FBI is waiting at their doorstep to come in and audit and look at everything and find out what is going wrong here. Um, that is available, but for those of us who think that Chicago is kind of a watershed moment right now, uh, and surprising a lot of us, uh, there is an actual opportunity to see significant change and to see some of the progress that we're making in, reform, in this reform movement over the last few years. Uh, for for that, I think that you know that, that this is really this is really where it all needs to break down, and we really need to kind of break this whole system open in Chicago, and see where its dark secrets lie. And uh, the Jordan Marsh case has shown us that that very much includes the city law department. Ken Womble, thank you for your time today, sir. Absolutely. That's all we have for this week. If you'd like to see more of the stuff we're working on, be sure to go check us out online at Fault Lines. You can find us on mimesislaw.com. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you'd like today's video, do us a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're listening to us over podcast, do us a favor and write us a positive review. It makes all the difference in the world. I'm Lee Pacquia. See you next time. FBI agents who were involved in this case um, are, are very professional. And based on the allegations in the indictment, clearly have evidence um, of substantial wrongdoing. We have to talk about the Wu-Tang album. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to know where it is. Martin, of course, uh, Martin Screlly, of course, uh, went out. Uh,